welcome. If you own a BBC Micro and you've built the light pen circuit, then stand by. Today's the day we're transmitting the light software in just a few moments. Stick your dark sucker over the annoying flashing blob. Now, this week's titles. Spectrum and loaded last week's software, you might have recognised the graphic sequence from David Thorpe, who also wrote those opening titles. David, welcome. Now, I understand that your background is completely different. It's not from a computer programming background. That's right. I've been in architecture all my life, and I bought a computer in uh, 1983 in the summer, and I did uh, a golf game called Royal Birkdale, which I took to Ocean Software. They liked the game, but they asked me to do um, an opening title picture for the game and I did it and uh, they quite liked it so they've asked me to do all their games since. Uh, so that was your first one, which is your sort of right. favourite graphic sequence or open uh, Probably Daley Thompson's Decathlon because uh, it was the best selling game last year um, and uh, I enjoyed doing it very much, particularly doing a portrait of Daley himself and getting it quite accurate on the screen. Now, graphics take up an awful lot of memory in a system. How do you manage to get all the animation that you use into a, a little thing well, like the Spectrum? I don't do that personally. Uh, Paul Owens from Ocean Software has done all the uh, machine code graphics for me. I, I did all the drawing, but he put all the programming in. But you can program yourself if necessary Yes, in well. basic, but it's uh, rather jerky in basic. <laughs> okay. Now, the other thing is, because of your different background, because you come from a creative and, and graphics background, do you go about doing the graphic sequence on a computer in a different way? Yes, I do. I uh, start by drawing it out on a piece of tracing paper which has the map of the screen grid on it, and uh, I work it out quite carefully on that, and then I put it in using a, a Melbourne draw system, which is in fact a tool for putting it into the, the uh, computer itself. So you decide up front what you want to get out of the, the graphic right, sequence yes. and then just use the computer as a tool? That's right. I organise it first and then put it in. That's very good. Thank you very much for doing that for Thank us. You. Thank, you. Thank you. Tony. Yes, Jane, and if you press the space bar on your BBC Micro, we're now going to start the first ever transmission of the Photon software. When we've finished, and once you've saved it, please remember to save it, reset the machine, and we'll give you a second chance to get it down later on in the programme. But bear with us, the whole thing is slightly experimental. Talking of software, you may have seen displays like this in your neighbourhood high street store. On this side, we've assembled 15 popular cassettes of games for Commodore machines all written by two guys. The maddening thing is that their combined ages is less than mine at the moment, and they're good at this. They're, one of their games, Games Creator, won the uh, Software of the Year at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas. They've won this thing, the Golden Joystick Award as Programmers of the Year from Commodore, although, frankly, I prefer the title rather than the prize. Their names are Richard and David Darling. They're right here. Uh, who's who? You're Richard. That's right. right. Let's get the horrible subject of age out of the way to begin with, so I get thoroughly depressed. You are? 17. And you are? 18. How did it all start? Uh, when we lived in Canada four years ago, um, our friend had an Atari games machine, and we used to play games on that, but we soon got fed up. So he got a VIC-20 and started programming, and we also got a VIC-20 and started programming games just as a hobby. Because at that time there were not many games with the VIC-20? No, that's right. There was hardly any you could actually buy. So if you wanted to play any games on the computer, you had to make them yourself. I see. When did you start getting to the point then where you had produced, if you like, a database of games which you were prepared to sell? When did all that happen? Um, we came back to England, which was... Uh, how, f how long ago was that? Beginning of 83. Yeah, beginning of 1983. And we put a, a few classified ads in, in a few of the magazines. And then it all started from there. And we just put bigger and bigger ads and sold more and more games. Now, that was your company, Galactic Software. Yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. Wasn't that a, a fairly um, odd commercial decision to make? Weren't there lots of people trying to sell games at that time? Um, well, during that year, they, there were lots of people started, but I think the boom sort of started in the summer, so we were a bit before the main part of the boom. Right. But what was it, do you think, about your games that made them commercially popular? Well, how, how come you made money out of them? What was good about them? Um, well, we started off on the VIC-20, and there, and there wasn't many games around for the VIC-20 at the time. One good, unique selling proposition. Right. Yeah. Well, what else? Were they good games, do you think? They, well, I consider them that they were good games. Um, All right. And also, we, we were selling them very cheaply at the time. 
we're selling them um, 14 games for 9.95, which was a lot cheaper than anybody else was at the time. So you weren't just immersed in computing then, you also had a good commercial sense. You'd identified a market, a market where there weren't many games, and you got the pricing right. Yeah. Now, how did you get involved with Mastertronic, which is where you are at the moment? Uh, that was at the beginning of 1984, and they, they were looking for somebody who could make quite a large number of games for them uh, in a relatively short amount of time. And because we had the games creator system that we were using ourselves on the 64, we could do that quite quickly. Now this was, let's talk about Games Creator for a moment, because I said it, it won a prize at Las Vegas. This was a system that you devised really for your own benefit to begin with, but is now available commercially and one imagines doing reasonably well. Will you tell me something about it? Um, yes, we developed it for ourselves so that we could write games, a lot of games for Mastertronic in, in a short period of time. And then when we finished it, we realised that it would have you know, a large commercial value. So then we adapted it so that anybody could use it. And now in England it's being marketed to a company called Mirrorsoft and it's been marketed in the States by Mastertronic. Do you think this is the way that games as such are now going to go, where people start to devise their own games? What I'm really asking is the day of the cassette game over. Um, I don't think it's over. I think that it's leveled out. It's not going to be an increasing market anymore. I think there'll always be, um, you know, the, everybody will always want computer games. But I think, you know, like board games have leveled out. They're not selling more and more mon Monopoly sets anymore. It's the same with computer games, that it's not, going to, it's not going to increase anymore. Sort of saturation point, is it? Yeah. yeah, people will still want new games, but it won't be an increasing amount of new games that they'll want. Now, it is interesting that people say that um, the effective life creatively in computing is very short, and you usually have to be very young. It's also perhaps significant that in, is it in Peter Pan and Wendy, Peter Pan, the boy who never grows up, lives with or goes out for his adventures with the Darling family. Is, are you getting to the point where you're going to run out of creative ideas and be burnt out in two years' time at the age of 21 or whatever? What do you think? Well, I hope not. Um, I think possibly it seems, it seems like it's a, a young person's thing to do to program, but I think that might just be because of the situation that young people are in. They have a lot of spare time and they have the time to, you know, to program on computers, so they develop that ability. But I, I see the reason why when you, when you get older, if you still spend the time programming, I see the reason why you shouldn't be just as good as the younger people at that time. I have an awful feeling that they're right. Finally and very briefly, if someone's got a good idea for a game and doesn't know what to do with it, what, what, how can you help? Can you help? Yeah, well, if they, if they could send it in to Thames TV, um, or a letter, if they send us a letter, we've had a lot of experience with computer companies around the country, and we could give them an advice on who to send it to, or what they should do with it, if they want to market themselves, or whatever. Thank you both very much indeed. That is an offer we can scarcely refuse. If you have such an idea, do send it to us at this address, Four computer buffs, Thames Television, 149 Tottenham Court Road, London W1P9LL. Now we're going to stay with software, and we find a dear old Ben Knox up to his neck in mud. Serves him right. Hi. Well, I guess that most people have played an adventure game on their micros at some time or another. If you have, then you'll have probably suffered the frustration of meeting so-called characters, which are obviously randomly generated. And when you come to the end of the game, that's it. There's nothing else except perhaps an advert for the next game from the company which wrote yours. In the studio this week, we have Richard Bartle, who is a lecturer at Essex University. Welcome, Richard. Hi, Ben. Now, Richard has developed a game called Mud, which looks set to eliminate your adventure blues. What exactly is Mud? Well, MUD stands for Multi-User Dungeon, and it's like an ordinary adventure game, except that instead of playing against computer-generated people, you play against real people. OK, perhaps you could show us how to play the game, then. Well, OK, um, I've already started playing, and I'm now still at the start. We're being harassed by a rabbit at the moment. So if I just wander around... Ah, there we are. There's John K. the Wizard. Say hello to him. I see, so you can actually have a conversation with someone else who's on the game. Oh, he's, yes. He's a real person. But it's just like an ordinary adventure game. Look, um... Oh, I see. So you can actually use the compass directions, as with a, a game like The Hobbit, to uh, move around the system. Mm -hmm. And it gives full descriptions. Oh, yes. Well, you can say brief. I mean, uh... So what? So you can cut it down just to a short mm -hmm. one-liner. Oh, it's devious here. That's devious where they are. Devious is another player, then? Yes, sir. Uh, we can see how many of the players there are. Um, say who. And um, the Toffee and Devious army, J John Cage probably cleared off somewhere, the wizard, he can I fly see. around. And we're Toffee and Devious is someone else. Mm hmm I see. Let's see. Mm -hmm. So if you just move around, there's a fire there. Ah. Oh. In the study. Ah. 
That's nearby here, so if I go east... So if we end up in a study, um... Ah. Lots of treasure there. Now, all these things are treasure, I see. Ah, yes, devious is there. No, I'll plug the devious, be nice. So, yeah. so you can actually sort of pass off human emotions oh, yes. and so on. Ah, oh, yes, I'll get some of that treasure while we're at it. Get all. So it should pick up a, a lot of treasure, yes. Tree genius tells you ha, ha, ha. Thanks very much, Richard. We have to stop you there. Obviously, this is a game which can keep you, keep you occupied for hours. If you have a Commodore 64, you can play it on CompuNet, where it costs £3 an hour. It's also available on Essex University's computer, which you can get onto via PSS. If you're taking part in our light pen experiment, press your spacebar now for your second chance to download the software. Now, if you're still stuck in a single-user adventure, here's Tony to throw your lifeline. Yes, it's all very well if you're good at adventure games, but in my case, I'm a total disaster. It's not that I can't ever finish them. I never get near that stage. I never get past first base. Well, help may be at hand. If you read Computer and Video Games magazine, you will perhaps have noticed that here in the middle is an Adventure Games helpline. I will give you an example of how it works, because the chap who runs it is with me, Keith Campbell. Keith, I have a letter here, which was sent to you, and I would uh, wonder if you would agree with me that this is typical of the sort of problem you get. It's from James Oram of Cluid, who says, Please could you tell me how to escape from the underground room with scratch marks on the wall without dying, and that's in the game Hulk. So how do you help him? Well, that's typical of the many letters I get about Hulk, and to help him, I use my database, Clues database, um, so shall we select the, the Hulk game and right, okay. see what we can find out? So we put there we go. Put Hulk in. This is stored is on a tandy, is it? That's yeah. right. Is that the game? Yes, that's the one we want. It's now reading the clues in and sorting them into alphabetical order. Now, this assumes, of course, that you've got all the clues. Where do you get the clues from? Some from myself, my own experience of playing the games, and some, f many, from the readers who write in with tips when I've printed a plea in the helpline. Oh, so you need help sometimes. Oh, yes. Well. OK, well, let's go back to the question. How, tell him how to escape from the underground room with the scratch marks on the wall without dying first. Right. Underground room, clue number 274. Fair enough. Let's get that one up. This is not going to be easy. I've got, a, I've got a very bad feeling about this. This says examine the walls. Now, if he examines the walls, he'll find scratch marks, but he won't be able to scratch the wall because he won't be strong enough. So there's a little rider on there saying, remember what Doctor Strange told you. But supposing he's never met Doctor Strange within the course of this game, which is in fact perfectly possible at this That's stage. That's the chances are he won't have done, in fact. Right. So we go back to the clue list, and there's two or three entries here on Doctor Strange, and the interesting one looks like, where is he? 1133. He's in the empty dome. He appears when you become Hulk. Right, and that in turn, I know, from my knowledge of this game, creates all kinds of other problems, doesn't it? Because you can only become Hulk for a short period of yes, time. they're all so. interconnected problems, yes. So, when you write back to your respondent, James Oram, here, and I know you do it because on these rather neat little um, postcards, you've only got a postcard size space to write back to him on. How much information do you give him? Do you tell him how to solve the game from that point? Well, uh, just give him the one point. Just give him the one point, and as little information as possible, really, because I'm trying to make him think, just pointing him in the right direction, so that he gets the maximum enjoyment out of the game, which is, after all, a puzzle. I think you get a sadistic kick out of making it even more difficult, actually. Probably. All right, well, look, so you would have given him about this much information. We'll assume that he's got himself back to the empty dome. What would you now put into the spectrum to help him out? Well, what I'd want to do? become Hulk, so I'd bite lip. So let's type bite lip. Yeah. Out um. I scream. I'm the incredible Hulk now. Astral projection of Doctor Strange. Ah, but now it's gone. And now it's gone. And gas has come into the room. And he's now Bruce Banner again. In other words, what you've done is you've translated James Oram's original problem into another problem somewhere else in the game. That's right. He's so now he's got to write to you again to get further advice. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, this is a marvellous idea, um, but it's an absolute dead ringer for going online, isn't it? Because at the moment it's only available by post. Yes. So are you going to do something about that? Yes, we're going to operate a phone-in service within the next three or four weeks into Computer and Video Games Office. And also for those who are subscribers to Micronet, we'll be um, online at Micronet with pages of tips, adventure news, and um, sending messages to people who are stuck. All right. Well, Keith, thank you very much indeed. I think, it, I think it's, a, it's a wizard idea, but look, don't, uh, don't get on to him if you want the answer, because I've been talking to him and he simply won't give it to you. Now for a different sort of adventure. 
an adventure into business software. Here's Jane. Up until recently, Cyan were only really renowned for their game software. And then last year, they launched their own pocket computer, the Cyan Organizer. And then in December, they announced Exchange, a set of integrated software, mainly for the business market. Now, Exchange runs on a variety of machines, but we're going to take a look at it running on the one per desk. Now, one advantage of using it on this particular system is that the software is loaded onto a chip, so I don't even have to bother with loading the software from diskette. Now, the first screen that Exchange presents you with is divided into three areas. The top area is the control area and shows me all the commands and functions that are available. The middle area is the display area, and at the bottom here we have a status line. Exchange being an integrated set of software has four different applications that we can use. We have Abacus, the spreadsheet, Quill, the word processor, Archive, which is a very powerful database, and Easel, a graphics program. Exchange, rather than running on Windows or a graphics environment, has opted for tasks. And I can have up to eight tasks active at any one moment in time. So far here, we've got three tasks. We've got letter, figures, and graph. Let's first of all take a look at Quill, the word processor. Quill is what the journalists call a WYSIWYG word processor. And for those of you compiling a dictionary of computer acronyms, that means what you see is what you get. And a good example of this can be seen if I go in and alter, for example, the right margin. So I ask to alter margins, say that we're going to alter the right one, and now you should see that that right margin all gets squashed in. On a lot of word processors, you wouldn't be able to see that until you printed it out. Well, a brief look at the word processor, but uh, let's press on. I come back to the main exchange menu. And I can leave any particular task exactly where I want to and return to it at any later stage. Now, exchange, as the name implies, means that we can exchange information from one application to another. So, let's have a go at that. I ask it to exchange information, and the first thing it asks me is, where do I want to get that information from? And we're going to take it from the spreadsheet. We've got some figures there of sales and cost figures. It then asks, where do I want to put that information? And I want to put it into a graph and plot the area as a graph. It first of all loads the spreadsheet for me so that I can tell it exactly how much information I want to take through. And we're going to take all the months of the year and the sales, the cost and the profits lines. And the rest of it just happens automatically. The figures are taken out of the spreadsheet, transported through to the graph paper and automatically plotted, showing me the sales, the cost and the profit lines. It even goes as far as to label all the different bars. Watching me give that demonstration of Exchange software was David Potter, the Managing Director of Sign. David, welcome to the programme. Good afternoon. Now, Exchange software, compared to some of the game software, is totally different. Why the branch from one area into the other? About two and a half years ago, we decided that it was commercially prudent to broaden and widen our markets. And so Exchange has been under development for the last two years. I think that was prudent. Right. Now, the, the change, does that mean you think the games market is on the decline slightly? No, I don't think so at all. But I think we are going to see a rapidly changing and evolving market in the home computer area. And I suspect that the computers we'll see in five years' time in the home are going to be very, very different from what we're seeing right now. So there's going to be great change and great flux and great evolution as well. Now, uh, exchange, I mean, taking you into the business market, uh, it's a fairly tough world in the business market. You think you can obviously survive there? I think it's a tough world in the home computer market, too. It's a tough world everywhere. Um, yes, undoubtedly. I think that uh, technically, in terms of the skills we have and the abilities we have, they're superb. The relationships that we have uh, around the world with the major computer manufacturers are excellent. And I have no doubt whatsoever that within uh, Europe, we can penetrate uh, and have a major impact in, in the business market. Now, the exchange software I was showing, I managed to show Quill and, and Abacus yes. and a few other things. There are some of sort of fairly advanced features I wasn't able to, to show you. Could you take us through some of those, just to tell us about them? Well, exchange is, is a huge uh, piece of software. It's in terms of scale, it's about the size of design of a jumbo jet with a couple of hundred thousand moving parts. So there are many, many parts to it. But. Uh, uh, as one example, uh, the database, for example, is actually a programming language and designed for uh, people to implement specialist applications such as hotel keeping, for example, or, or stock recording and so on. 
Um, so in fact, we're talking about a, a huge range uh, of productivity and general purpose software. And what about, I think there's also something called the, the task sequence language. The task sequencing language, yes. That's to allow the user to customize something which he repeatedly does. It can also be used for, for training and support purposes and so on. But it's really to customize something that you do frequently and then you don't have to go through and do it again and again. So the example I was using of taking some figures from a spreadsheet into a, a graph exactly. package, I could task sequence that so I didn't even have to type in exchange and what I wanted that to exchange. That is correct. You could one key that effectively so that it was automatic if that's what you were doing frequently. Say like at the end of every month or something. Yes, indeed. Yes. Now, the Cyan Organizer, I must admit when that first came out, I saw it as a, a rather glorified sort of calculator, if you like. I've changed, I <laughs> changed ideas about it now. Can you tell us some of the areas you think that's going into as well? We see the organizers as, as, as a very, very exciting product, and uh, I think we're going to be able to make announcements fairly soon, just showing the huge diversity of OEM, or original equipment uh, applications, that it has. Um, the range is, is massive. Uh, we've been inundated by several hundreds of specialized and major market applications. A few examples, credit card control, uh, uh, data logging for recording of expenses, for example, or for field service engineers. That could be for salespeople, say, out on the road taking orders and exactly, and sending them back. exactly merchandising and stock control. Uh, so the organizer is, in fact, a general-purpose computer in a small little box. It has uh, barcode readers, magnetic card readers, uh, communications modems, and so on coming along. Some of those things are out. Some of them are coming right. along. Uh, and, and so the range of applications is, in fact, huge. Well, David, thank you very much for coming along and talking to us. Thank you very much indeed, Jane. Thank you. Hmm, interesting. Now, news. Guy, before you start, any news on these persistent rumours of the future, or lack of it, of the Acorn Electron? Yes, rumours. There have been lots of them. Well, they seem to be false rumours. Acorn's Electron is not, after all, going to be killed off, despite anything you may have heard. Or so says Acorn's temporary chairman, that's Alex Reed. And indeed, there's no reason to doubt him, because one thing that Acorn is not short of is electrons. The warehouse is jammed with them, and at their new low price, they're selling quite well. What Alex Reed was careful not to promise was that he would actually build any electrons this year. I gather that even with sales at present levels, stocks may last till Christmas. Let's hope news that it's not being killed off cheers up city financiers. But somehow I doubt it. The city is in a simple state of panic about micros. They've decided that the boom is over. They've decided that micros like skateboards are a dead fad, and the fact that more micros were sold this Christmas than last year doesn't impress them. Proof of city idiocy? Well, try Amstrad. Amstrad just announced better profits than ever before. And its figures show that the improvement is almost entirely due to have adding, having added micros to its audio business. Great, you might think, but the city responded by knocking several pence off the share price. Oh, my goodness, we'd forgotten Amstrad was into micros, they cried. Sell, sell. <laughs> there certainly does seem to be a great deal of city paranoia about the micro business. I mean, every single Sunday heavy paper has got article after article about the problems. Amstrad has had some very good figures. Presumably, therefore, that PC trade show that was on the other day was extremely peaceful, was it? <laughs> Well, I don't know what the city's going to make of the PC trade show. The PC trade show, last week, new exhibition organised by EMAP. They're the publishers of PC User. PC User show is normally a great success. I have to admit that I always thought it was mainly a trade show. So what EMAP was thinking of by making a trade-only version of it, especially when other micro trade shows have been fading, I can't guess. Anyway, it was a nice, peaceful little show. <laughs> Nothing much to see, nobody to speak of looking at it, but plenty of empty chairs to sit in and gossip. My favourite bit of gossip concerned a battle between Intel and the Japanese firm NEC. News of this comes from John Vorak in America. He tells me that the V20 and V30 chips recently announced by NEC are claimed by Intel to be simple copies of its 8088 and 8086 family, as used in the IBM PC. NEC has said its defence in the upcoming lawsuit will be that they are not imitating the Intel chip. And anyway, even if they are, they are only imitating the on-chip software and there is no such thing as copyright in microcode. Meanwhile, things are looking rather better than they have for our own ACT with its apricot. Just as IBM's own operating system for its AT model is coming under heavy fire from observers, Vorak reports an article on the CompuServe network entitled Top View, Flop View, because of the operating system's slowness and clumsiness. Well, I've discovered that ACT also is working hard on its own supermicro based on the 8286 chip as used in the AT. The Apricot AT is still a secret, but I can reveal that the company which has always announced its new machines with great razzmatazz in the Albert Hall has asked if the venue is free for July. Ah, 
But July of which year? Don't ask. <laughs> Now, uh, tomorrow morning's free software transmission is for both the Commodore 64 and the Spectrum. And next week on the programme, the light pen software will be for the Commodore 64. And do let us know how you've got on with the light software we've been transmitting throughout this programme. Because if you want to let us know, use the Prestel mailbox, page 7776, or use the bullet board. Ah, a little note about the bullet board. A lot of people have been using the bullet board with considerable success. And a lot of you have very much enjoyed leaving messages and getting some of the answers back. But there's a problem with it. It's the same sort of problem that seems to possess people when they take over a perfectly reasonable telephone box in working order and then vandalise it. They extract such small sum of money as is in there and no one else can then use the telephone. Well, a similar sort of thing appears to be happening with the bullet board. Like all online systems, one or two idiots have decided to start leaving obscene messages. Well, we have a simple message for those who've been doing that. By all means, carry on. All that will then happen is that the Nottingham Building Society will close down the bullet board facility to everybody else, so you'll have really won. So, as Arthur Daly would say, leave it out, lads. We'll be back at the same time next week for another four computer buffs. Till then, bye-bye. <laughs>